I do have pockets. Okay, so uh, we're not missing any students. We're missing some instructors. So that's fine. They've seen stuff before. Um, so this is the follow-on to what Kurt was talking about. Um, I'm more of an instrumental person. And so uh, some of it will be a repeat, and some of it will go into the instrumentation part. Um, so anyway, so my, my expertise is in instrumentation and such. And so um, while radiance is really the fundamental property, you can get everything from the radiance distribution. Um, irradiance is uh, a detector. It's easier to understand. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start at irradiance and go to radiance from that way. Um, first, we'll talk about spectral resolution of detectors, uh, then plane irradiance, scalar irradiance, and then radiance and radiance distribution measurements. And I think at the end, I do a little bit about atmospheric measurements also. Um, and because we're going to, this afternoon, we will have, if it clears up at all, we could make some atmospheric measurements with one of the instruments I brought with me. Uh, if it stays like this, we're not going to do anything with it. But, okay, so in general, though, what does the light field look like that we're trying to measure? Um, this is wavelengths from, here's 400 to 900 nanometers. Uh, I, the red line is the down, well, I'm sorry, the black line is the surface downwell irradiance, the sunlight that's come down through the atmosphere um, and skylight. And the red line is the upwelling radiance from clear water right above the surface. It's called LW. Um, what you see is you have all sorts of spectral features in the signal. Some of them coming from uh, atmospheric absorption lines, some of them coming from solar Fraunhofer lines, so they start out extraterrestrial, and you're always going to have it. But there's a lot of sharp features, and this, at this spectral resolution, um, I think, I'm not, this is probably around a nanometer spectral resolution, we'll talk about that in a bit. If you went to a tenth of a nanometer, it would get even more confusing. If you go to a hundredth of a nanometer, it just is filled up with lines. So. As the sh it's got a lot of sharp features, and the closer you look at it, the more features are going to be in there. Okay, but you can see we're, we're values for the downwelling is about 188, 180. Um, my preferred units are microwatts per centimeter squared per nanometer. Um, most of my instruments measure with those units. Um, upwelling is here, peaks at about 2. In this example, in clear water, uh, two microwatts per centimeter squared per nanometer. So there's a large dynamic range between looking, uh, looking at the light coming down versus looking at the light coming up. Are these scalar or plane? So these are plane irradiances, downwelling irradiance. So and typically, what's that? If it is scalar, would that make a difference in the wavelength? In in terms of the sharpness of it or the magnitude? Um, it would it would still have most of these features in the in the scalar radiance in terms of spectral features. It would change the magnitude. Um, well, uh, yeah, it would change the magnitude mostly probably for the downwelling irradiance. It would mostly change the magnitude in terms of the sun zenith of the sun angle. You could use that to do a quick correction for it because um, the downwelling above the surface at least 50%, usually more, is direct solar irradiance, okay? And so with a scalar irradiance, the direct solar irradiance has a cosine factor of the sun zenith angle, and the scalar wouldn't have that in there. So you could do a quick correction that way. But, yeah, I guess I should, when I don't say what kind of irradiance it is, it's, it's a plain irradiance, downwelling irradiance. Okay, and so um, we'll start with uh, defining the detectors and instruments by spectral resolution. Do you have the yeah, I think so. Yeah. yeah. Um, so uh, we'll start by defining spectral resolution. You guys have all been exposed to this now already, somewhat with the AC9 and and the ACSs. Um, there's sort of like three classes you could think of spectral resolution. 
the first would be with these broadband instruments like PAR, um, UVA, you can get photopic sensors that integrate over a large uh, wavelength band, just give you one number. Uh, Multi-channel instruments, collection of individual bands, say typically we, we tend to work with um, 10 nanometer wide spectral bands. Um, you could have um, as many of these individual bands as you want or as you can afford or whatever in the instrument. Um, like AC9, same idea for radiometers. And then hyperspectral instruments where you have measurements every few nanometers through the visible spectrum. So it used to be everybody had, well, in the, before the early 80s, pretty much people only had broadband instruments. And if you look at measurements from the 50s and 60s, people were using photopic measurements, um, which meant that they had one filter that matched your eye spectrum and they just used that. Um, in the 80s, late eight, later 80s, uh, multi-channel instruments came up where people had, had the electronics had advanced enough you could have multiple channels and so multi-channel instruments were the thing. And probably um, more recently, some people always had hyperspectral instruments, but they're very one-off things. Commercially, probably only in the last 10 years or 15 years have, have people gotten hyperspectral instruments regularly. Um, so anyway, so those are the three classes of the things. To go through them individually, uh, um, uh, Kurt introduced uh, PAR already. Um, so. That's the idea that you want to uh, count, try to count photons in a range from 400 to 700 nanometers. You give equal, equal weight to each photon. Um, silicon detectors uh, through the photoelectric effect. Um, he, he sort of showed that at the beginning when he was explaining photons a little bit. Uh, basically, that's how a silicon detector works. It takes a photon in and promotes an electron up, and you measure that electron in some way. And so a silicon detector in some way is really cool in terms of using photosynthetically available radiation where you're trying to weight each photon equivalently. Um, there are problems, a, a silicon detector isn't perfect. Um, there's scattering in the detector that uh, will cause uh, some wavelengths to be more, if some, the detector to be more sensitive to some wavelengths than the other. There's reabsorption of photoelectrons sometimes, um, so the higher electron, higher energy electrons can get reabsorbed, and so it is. These things aren't perfect um, photon weighted uh, detectors. Um, PAR is not really a very nice, what I call a nice measurement, meaning it's broadband, so it's very hard to calibrate these things. Um, it depends what you get out in terms of energy depends on what your source looks like. So it's a, it's a really hard thing to calibrate. So it's not easy, easy to calibrate. It's probably not very exact when you're done, but um, it, it is easy to go out in the field with one, and get one number out, which is, so biologists love that. Um, and it's important for the biology, so they, it's applicable to that. Um, I already told you photopic is like center at the eye. That's not very popular now. It used to be. And all these broadband things are very hard to calibrate. Um, depends on the spectral composition of the light field you're looking at. And uh, it's sort of a mess. Okay. Narrowband instruments. Um, as I said, they're about 10 nanometer wide in general channels. Um, they're used because uh, most ocean optics parameters don't have very strong spectral features. Um, so you can get away with something like this. The satellites that we're trying this, what is the title of this class? It's, it's like uh, ocean optics for satellite calibration, right? And validation. Um, so a lot of the work we're doing lately has been to do ground truth validation for satellite measurements. And the satellites measure in 10 or 20 or 30 nanometer bands, depends on the instrument. 
Um, so the 10 nanometer, if you match these to the satellite uh, that you're concerned with, you can get away with that less expensively than a, um, a hyperspectral instrument, and, there's, and you avoid some other problems that we'll talk about. Um, when you look at reflectance, when a lot of the measurements you make, you take a ratio of the downwelling to upwelling. All those fancy features that I showed um, occur both roughly the same in upwelling as they do downwelling. And so when you ref take a reflectance, which means a ratio of downwelling and upwelling, a lot of those features go away. Okay, so all these sharp features you saw in the downwelling signal, in the reflectance signal, they sort of cancel out. And so a 10 nanometer band sp uh, spectral band works out pretty well. Um, okay, so that's some of the reasons why people use multi-channel instead of something else. Uh, the spectral channels are defined by filters, typically interference filters. They have some spectral shape and you have to worry about out-of-band effects and to just show you what that means. Here's a uh, two uh, channels on a satellite sensor. Um, this obviously is up in the, in the red wavelengths, 800 nanometers to 1,000. So we define a filter by the full width at half maximum. So you just take the peak and come out to where half of it is, and that defines the width of the filter. So you always see uh, the, fil the bandwidth defined as this FWHM. Um, so this one's a 40 nanometer uh, bandwidth, and you define the band center not as where the peak is, but it's half, uh, half of that uh, between the, the two points. So the filter is defined by the band center and by the full width at half maximum. Now, this one's pretty nice. Well, it's not quite nice. Here's 860 nanometers, and over here you have another little peak coming up here in, in four, I don't know, 420 nanometers or so. And so these, this is considered out of band. You don't really want this. But when they made the filter here, they ended up with this and they couldn't get rid of it. And if you think about um, the light at the surface of the ocean coming out of the ocean, if we have clear water, how much light's coming out at 860 nanometers? Virtually none. Right, it's those you've got strong absorption by water, um, and so almost no lights coming out here. But there's a fair amount of light at 420. Okay, so when you look at this out of band, and you're looking at different colored sources, the effect of this can be very well can vary as to how important this is relative to that. And right at the ocean surface this filter is not going to be very good because it's going to take a lot of light from here that you don't want and there's, you know, as part of your signal, okay? So you have to worry about that out-of-band stuff. Um, so th there's that. Now, these, this channel is here in a satellite sensor to do atmospheric correction. So at the top of the atmosphere, it's not quite as bad as it is right at the surface, which is why they can get away with that a little bit. Okay, so everybody see how the out of band and stuff works? Okay, so that's uh, multi channel uh, hyperspectral detectors like the ACS. Uh, the idea is you have a continuous spectrum of some sort of measurements. Uh, channels every one to 10 nanometers, depends on your spectrometer. Basically, light's coming in, there's some sort of a slit, you have some sort of a dispersive element, prism. Um, you can have a, uh, a reflective grating. I don't know if you remember your physics well enough uh, or they taught you your, that in physics, but how reflective gratings could do dispersion. Um, and then you have some sort of uh, either your, um, this spectrometer that we had over on the desk over there uh, basically had one slit at the output and then varied the prism angle as it chugged along. And uh, that, so it, as the angle of this prism changed, it selected which wavelength it was looking at. Uh, most instruments will have a LED or some sort of an array of um, detectors here that you're measuring the output at. 
So you have lots of channels, sort of continuous, some sort of dispersive element in there, prism, grating, etc. cetera. Um, and the nice thing with a hyperspectral detector is to some extent you can build an integrated channel. So if you have hyperspectral measurement of the upwelling radiance, say, or the water leaving radiance, then you can match whatever satellite sensor you want to do. And you can include matching the out of band effects in that instrument. So um, with a hyperspectral, you have a lot more flexibility, but it adds more complications in the measurements to some extent. Uh, one thing you have to worry about with hyperspectral sensors is stray light. So when we had the multi-channel, we had out of band problems. When you have a hyperspectral sensor, what you have is stray light. Um, if the incident ray comes in, hits your dispersive element or whatever, and the specular part is the part that you want, you would like all of that wavelength to come out at. There's sort of two parts to it. There's a, a haze. So here's a picture of the spectral beam. You'd like to have this input all come out at this one wavelength. There's sort of a haze to the, um, to the stray light. And then there's a diffuse component that just goes sort of all the way across. So every hyperspectral instrument is going to have um, this stray light in there. Light showing up at this wavelength, say, or that wavelength that you really um, didn't want, that it really was from this wavelength that ended up over there. And so if you have the, one of these instruments, you want to make sure that it's, they've done the stray light correction on it is the main problem. To show where that shows up, yeah, sure. Stop me. Ooh, how, how far? With with this? Um, no, it really. Um, what you really have to do is do a stray light uh, characterization of your instrument, and what you what the way the best way to do it, and what we're doing, for the most part, is you take a laser and you shoot it in and see where it shows up on your array. And since this thing's going to be spectral, you have to have a whole array of lasers. And so you keep shooting lasers into the system and showing where it set, uh, shows up. And then you do a matrix inversion so that when you look at your signal, you try to take out the part, half parts of it. That makes sense? Um, the problem with that is there's also stray light if your s detectors start at 350 to 700 and you're not careful, you can have stray light from 320, which you didn't measure, showing up over here. And so it requires a bunch of parts of instrument design to try to keep that down. Yeah? Okay, so we, it's actually, we talk about out of band for multi-channel instruments where you have a filter defining what you're going to accept, okay? So, and, and so out of band means uh, same, same thing, really. Stray light and that, except that here, it's how this filter is spectrally defined, the region you're going to look at, okay? So I, we sp I speak of out of band as being, you know, most people out of band with filter instruments. Stray light is um, light showing out at someplace else on this array that you don't really want it to come from. Light from here showing up over there. It has the same effect in the end. The nice thing with a hyperspectral instrument is you actually have some hope of being able to correct for it. Because I, I did measure how much light was there, so I, know, I think I know how much light showed up over here because of that light. And so I can correct for it. But in a, in a way, you'll read papers and they'll talk about stray light in multi-channel instruments, but you really mean out of band. But yeah. Yeah, no, that's that's true. Yeah. 
That's fine. Yeah, that's true. And that, and, and, but you'll see people talk about stray light and multi-channel instruments. They really mean out of band, but they're not very careful with it. So. The scattering effect causes a spectral effect. Right. Well, yeah. yeah. The, the scattering effect causes your spectrum to be bad. And to show example of that, here's um, next week or sometime I give a talk about Moby to you guys. Uh, Moby is a marine optical buoy. It's a buoy that's off Hawaii and used for um, satellite um, vicarious calibration. And we're always, I'm now PI of Moby project, but it's, for, it's, it's 20 years old. For the history, it's always trying to push the measurement science as hard as it can. And that's really what we concentrate on. Um, if you look here, where stray light really it showed that it was really important, here's a blue, the blue spectrograph. There's two spectrographs in it, one that handled the blue side up to about six, um, 640 nanometers, and the red uh, spectrograph handles from like 550 up, and there's this overlap region between the two that you can compare the two measurements. Um, and what we were seeing with Moby was a large difference here between the two measurements in the red-blue overlap region. And that was basically realized after a while that that was stray light was causing that. And by doing a stray light correction, and what happens with stray light, stray light's only important, really important, when uh, you're looking in a part of the spectrograph that doesn't, shouldn't have much light in it because a stray light adds a bunch from where there's a lot of light. So the blue spectrograph, the black line is stray light corrected. Um, actually, an old stray light correction, I guess. The um, blue line is before stray light correction. And it's important over here because there's a lot of light in the blue, not much light in the red. So the scatter light contributes an enormous amount. It also is important over here in the um, UV section for the same reason. There's a lot of light at 400, above 400 nanometers, and uh, it gets scattered into the area in the blue. And actually, notice what's happened. In the blue, stray light has actually caused the um, signal to be higher than it was after the stray light correction, okay? So this blue is above black. Look what's going on on the other side. It's actually the other effect. Okay? Sort of seems weird when I'm saying that that's what's going on. Um, the reason that is, is uh, I think I talk about it a little bit. Oh, here. If you look, this is the spectrum of the water leaf or upwelling radiance um, that we've seen before. It's peaked at 400 nanometers. This is, the red line is a spectrum of a calibration lamp. The way you calibrate these things is you look at some lamp, a high temperature lamp, a thousand watt lamp, and its spectrum, it's a black body, but its temperature is not as high as the sun, probably fortunate for us. Um, and so it's a black body that peaks over here. And so it's very, lots of light in the red and very little light in the blue. So when you calibrate, you sort of assign how much, um, if I get a signal here, uh, that that signal there is due to this much light, and so I get a calibration number. When I use the calibration, and I haven't done a stray light correction, a lot of this red light has been shifted here, so I have too much. So my calibration number ends up being too small, which causes the, uh, the effect there. So here, it's because of stray light in the field. That is actually stray light that happened because of the calibration process. Okay, so it's sort of subtle. You have to look at it. Anyway, so stray light's something, if you have a hyperspectral sensor, you need to care, care about. If you buy a sensor, you want to make sure if whoever sold it to you did the stray light, gave you the stray light characterization, which isn't actually very common, but you should do it. Okay, the other thing is bandwidth for the hyperspectral sensors. Um, 
the top graph is what the downwelling irradiance looks like uh, when you have a one nanometer full width AVMAX like MOBI. Um, this is what it looks like when you take that and put it to a 10 nanometer full width AVMAX sensor like the Hyperprose that we're going to be playing with. Uh, most commercial instruments are on that order. And you can see that all lots of the sharp features are sort of washed out in there. So what you see will depend on what the bandwidth is of your um, detector. So those are the spectral characteristics, okay? So we have those three. And now we look at the different things they measure. Kurt already showed you this. So plane irradiance, perfect one, a hole, and you just collect whatever comes through that hole. Unfortunately, we can't do that. Um, detectors have an angular response, like he says. If you want to measure the spectral ir uh, plane irradiance, you've got to have a filter in there. The filter's response varies on angle of stuff coming through it, and so that's not going to be very good. Uh, the detector has an angular response. Invariably, none of our electronics work very well when they've got water. They're inside water, right? So you're going to have to have a window somewhere in there to pr keep the s detectors in air and the water outside. And um, if you look at what happens to the window at higher angles, the window is going to reflect more light off of it. And so that's going to screw up your, your collection. So um, just making a detector like that is a pretty poor irradiance sensor. What you'll see in the lab, and you've, you use the irradiance detector to measure um, the, uh, the spectrum coming out of your BB. So everybody did that. If you notice what the irradiance detector looks like, it has a, um, basically a diffuser here, and then a, a sort of a, a lip on the outside of it. Remember that? So the diffuser, the idea with the diffuser is sort of gets rid of the angular dependence coming in. The idea of this step over here is that when you get to larger angles, so I go off like this, now instead of just exposing the air, area of the top of, the, of that collector, it's the light coming in can expose the side. Okay, so I get more light into that collector at larger angles. And then eventually, when I come in from the side, this whole thing is below the lip and it keeps light from coming in at the sides, okay? So the idea of this, this uh, height is to increase the light that can get into this diffuser as a larger angle to make up for the fact that lots of it's gonna be reflected off the surface at the larger angle. So when you're designing one of these things, there's sort of a magic um, empirically having, you have to determine it empirically, ratio of what the height should be versus the area, and it depends on whatever the kind of material you have, and so, and the only way to do it is trial and error, so it, it's a mess to design one of these things, but the, hopefully your company that you bought it from has done it, gone through the whole exercise of that. Um, so, you have a plastic, plastic diffuser, rays, so you get more light um, than would it be with just a flat surface coming in this area. Uh, there's a hole behind, some sort of a size hole behind the, the diffuser. You move the filter back from the diffuser so that when the filter is looking at the back of this diffuser, there's a more limited range of angles that it's going through and then you have your detector there. So that's, oh, and the other point that's important is the bold letters there. A cosine collector designed to be used in air is not the same as a cosine collector designed to be used in the water. So um, they're not interchangeable. So when you buy one, you buy it for whatever you want. You prefer not to use it unless you have to, like we're going to do in our lab this afternoon use one that was designed for water, we're going to use it as a, if it was designed in air. The, it's not quite as accurate that way, but that's life. So the, the diffuser is white? The diffusers are white. So it scatters light, light back up? 
it, it, the material is such that it scatters all sorts of light all over the direction. Very, it scatters light in all directions. Okay, and some of the light gets scattered and it keeps going through to here. Okay. Um, here's a picture of the uh, collection efficiency. Um, basically, the response of the detector of the collector as a function of angle divided by the cosine of that angle. Because if you had it perfect, you'd want this error to be zero. This sort of shows that up to 50 degrees or so, it's pretty close to zero, then it starts diverging rapidly. And so uh, at low sun angles, an irradiance collector is not going to be very good. It's not going to be, it's going to have more error for light that's coming in at larger angles. Um, <coughs> so something to watch out for. Um, to give you an idea of what field that means in terms of the um, light field, I'll do this graph more later when I talk about radiance distribution. But the black line here is the average um, radiance for, for different angles. Um, and as Kurt said, I'm an instrument person. I tend to look, tell you what the angle is in terms of where I'm looking with my camera versus which way the photon or the energy was coming from. So in this picture, it's 1 meters, 5 meter, 10 meter, and 30 meter, looking at the radiance distribution. Um, the main thing to note, uh, I'll talk more about this in a bit, but the main thing I want to note here is that most of the light in the downwelling light field is coming in in this range from plus or minus 50 degrees. So it's downwelling light field, the irradiance collector is doing a pretty good job. Um, and so for the downwelling light field, Downwelling irradiance makes a pretty good measurement in general. Um, here's upwelling light field. Uh, this is in low chlorophyll water, very clear water. This is in high chlorophyll water, more turbid. Um, the radiance distribution for the upwelling light field is fairly flat in the clear water. Um, for the Upwelling light field for high chlorophyll, the radiance distribution is more cupped. In, in the way I describe it is that, or there's more light coming from the edges than from straight down. And remember, where's the air in a cosine collector? It's on the edges. So an upwelling radiance, upwelling irradiance measurement is really never going to be a very good measurement with an irradiance collector um, because it it's just has much more air due to the cosine collector. So there's good, you're going to inherently have problems there. The next thing I sh need to describe of problems with collectors is um, we typically, we always calibrate these things in air because that's the best play I can breathe inside my uh, calibration facility. So I have a lamp and I sh shine uh, that lamp on my irradiance collector and I do my calibrations and then I go and stick the thing in the water and now um, there's a medium out here that's no longer looks like my calibration lab and what ends up happening is there's this thing called the immersion factor and the way the immersion factor works is that if you think um, about this diffuser it light comes in the diffuser scatters all over the place and some of the light can be backscattered out into the environment from that diffuser. If it's air out here, there's a much bigger index refraction gradient between the air and the diffuser, plastic <laughs> diffuser. And so it's harder for the light to escape. So it tends not to um, come back out as easily and keeps diffusing around and more of it gets into your detector here, which is always in the same medium, I hope, until you wreck your instrument. It's always in air. Um, if you put in water now, the index refraction is higher here and it's easier for light that's in the diffuser to backscatter out of it, okay? And so your detection efficiency is going to be a little bit higher when you're in air than you're when you're in water. And it's about a 30 or 40 percent difference between the two. So um, the important thing here is that there's an immersion uh, coefficient you need to use when it's in the water. 
Um, I just drew normal incidence here. It's a large set of a bunch of angles. It's spectrally dependent because it depends on the index refraction and properties of the diffuser and the water at different um, <coughs> wavelengths. It's really design dependent. It's difficult to model. So you have to characterize that for your instrument. And um, so when you buy an instrument from the from the vendor, hopefully he's given you an immersion coefficient that hopefully he's measured for your instrument, um, or at least for the class of that that run of uh, plastics and such that he used. Um, and when you get around to working in the lab or in in for the lab, the radiometry lab today and on the ship, um, there's a checkbox in the software that you have to go in and check to say whether you've got that irradiance collector in the air or in the water. Um, so, so that's important to do. So it's actually better to have a higher gradient in the index refraction. If you have a higher gradient in the index refraction, um, you're going to get better collection efficiency. Um, better, I don't know, uh, no. you, these things, yeah, you get more collection efficiency, but usually not light limited, so that's not a big issue. The big issue is making sure you know when your calibration was done. And <clears throat> like I say, it's important to do this. It depends on the plastic, so it's important that the, your vendor, whoever you bought it from, has done the immersion correction or characterization for it on that series of instrument of instruments effectively. If he changes materials for some reason, that's not going to work anymore correctly. Okay. <clears throat> this is sort of like what um, um, Kurt said or showed earlier, just to give you a magnitude what it looks like, irradiance looks like, plain irradiance. This is for a blue water station came from Mar Lewis, Lewis, Marlon Lewis at Set Atlantic, so it was with hyperprose. Um, so 10 nanometer spectral bands. You can see sort of what I showed you before. <coughs> um, so it, as, as you go down in the water column, you're losing, in this water, you're losing a little bit of light because of um, the uh, CDOM. So you're using light a little more rapidly in the blue side, this deep blue part, and you're losing light in the red very quickly because of absorption of water. Um, if we look at a green water station, um, you lose the light in the blue and green or through 400, 500 nanometers much more quickly, so the peak in the downwelling spectrum moves off to 550. So. Um, so the difference between blue water and green water. See how the peak shifted. <clears throat> okay, so to calibrate this sensor, you set it up in the lab with a known source of irradiance, typically a, a lamp. Uh, we use 1,000-watt uh, lamps. Um, calibrated in the U.S., calibrated it, um, somehow traceable to NIST, the Institute of Standards. Um, and you set it up at, say, some distance, 50 or 100 centimeters from your instrument, and um, you measure what it gives you out and counts. You know what the lamp's supposed to put out, and you can come up with your calibration coefficient. Uh, there's a whole bunch of other subtleties in doing this. It's not something... Um, with the AC meters, you want to make sure you do in your lab all the time, and you can do it in your lab. For those with these, it's very difficult to come up with a, to do a good calibration, so you're probably not going to do it in your lab. You're probably going to send it back. There's only a few places that do it well. So, okay, so that was irradiance, um, plane irradiance, scalar irradiance. You saw this already. You'd like to measure um, all the light coming from all the different directions with equal weights. This is a picture from Kurt's book. Um, the problems with this measurement, um, basically, uh, think about if you wanted really scalar irradiance and you have this, uh, how do you deal with the light coming into the horizon from the horizon? You could have this, this thing go effectively out to infinity. That would keep 
um, the light from here coming up and hitting this detector. If you want to measure the total scalar, which is what you really want, you want the combination of the downwelling part and the upwelling part. If you flip this over, you're going to be collecting light horizontally on both of them. It's a little bit strange, but um, the basic concept of a, of a scalar radiance sensor is a ball that you're trying to collect the light equally from. And that's what, if you look at an array up, a scalar radiance meter, it basically is that. It's a ping pong ball, and they're somehow getting the light out of the ping pong ball. Um, and given these measurements are usually to measure not spectrally, but PAR, given the is issues you already have with measuring PAR, a little bit of problems with this are not your major issue. To give you a magnitude of what those are, here's for uh, um, different depths where I've calculated from a radiance distribution, I calculated what the ED is, E0, um, the scalar radiance downwelling uh, E up, uh, the scalar E up, and then um, what's the average cosine? The average cosine is the ratio between ED over E0. Um, you can see at all these depths, the irradiance change, changed fairly drastically from uh, the different at the different, uh, I don't list what wavelength this is, do I? Oh, up pulling at 5, 5, 505, down pulling at 503. So here's the average cosine, the ratio. Notice how stable the, actually the average cosines are at the different uh, depths. So yeah. Okay, so, so the idea is it's um, ED over E0. So if we look, we have an integral of L um, over solid angle of L cosine theta d omega on the top divided by the integral of L uh, d omega on the bottom for scalar radiance. Okay, so you have the top has that cosine factor in there. And so, um, if you were uh, so doing this on the fly, I'm I'm not as good as Kurt at doing math. On I try to figure out my questions before they they get asked. But basically, if you thought about making an average here, so an average of that, um, the integral of uh, over omega d omega over the average L, um, you end up sort of dropping out and having cosine theta average there once you take the ratio, okay? So you talk about having an av the average cosine. Um, basically what it means is that if all the light came in at that one angle, that would be the, it would give you the ratio, the same ratio as you did doing the integral, okay? Um, so, to a certain extent, close to the surface, this is really uh, related to the solar zenith angle in the water. It'll be right about that near the surface for the downwelling part. Okay. Um, so there is scalar irradiance, sort of give you magnitude. Notice the upwelling. The downwelling, it's about 0.7, which if you have the cosine, that means it's closer to zero degrees. And for the upwelling, it's uh, 0.3, so it's closer to 90 degrees than that. So, um, so there. Okay, so here's radiance now. Um, the one thing I, well, I was watch looking at this when Kurt showed it, because it's his picture again. Um, this would have a little bit of a problem putting the filter here, because you're going to get a large range of angles going through that filter. So we're going to have a problem with the uh, spectral response of that instrument. But this is the simplest uh, uh, radiance sensor. It's just a Gershon tube, as, as Kurt described. Um, and most often, radiance is measured with some sort of a Gershon tube. 
Um, but it'd be nice to use radiance in all sorts of other directions. Um, so to do that, it's called the radiance distribution. It's basically how much radiance is coming from all the different angles. Um, there's way, the way to measure that is either have a Gerson tube that you shine all over the place, um, which Tyler did in 1960, or with a camera, what a camera is measuring is basically a radiance distribution of whatever is in the field of view. So if I have a fisheye camera, everybody know what a fisheye looks like? Yeah, so the fisheye collects all of the hemisphere, and so I can do all of that at once. And so um, Ray Smith and Tyler had a system like that in 1970. Started with that method. Here's some pictures from old um, instruments. This is Tyler's instrument. So I said it had a it had actually a radiometer pushing this pointing this way, a Gershon tube, Gershon tube radiometer pointing up. He had a little motor in here with a fin. He could swivel it around to whatever angle he wanted to look at. He could rotate this to look at that direction measure at least two things at once. Um, here's a picture of testing this in the um, visibility lab, which was a lab that was associated with Scripps Institute Oceanography back until 1987. <laughs> um, yeah, 1987. Um, this shows a picture of their water tank they had in the middle of the facility and uh, a bunch of engineers. Um, this is Jerry Edwards. I think this is Ted Petzold, but he doesn't have a pipe in his hand, so it's a little harder to tell. Ted, you've, the Petzold phase functions that you talk about, um, it was a really, not, really good engineer um, at the Viz Lab, who I looked up the other day. Um, we were, Kurt and I were talking about it, and I looked it up on the web, and he's apparently, at least I could get his phone number, so I think he's still alive and living in Vail, Arizona. He's 91 years old. Jerry is still alive, and I'm not sure who the other guys are in that picture. I think that might be Tyler, but that's a guess. Um, I was at the Viz Lab for five years, did my postdoc and such. Um, here's a picture of the instrument being dropped in the water at Lake Pondre, which is the main data set that you see with the instrument. Um, a more modern instrument this is a picture of new rads, uh, which is an upwelling radiance distribution instrument. Because the main thing people in general concerned with was looking at uh, what the satellite view direction looks like. Because the satellite looking down here will see the upwelling radiance from straight up. Satellite viewing this direction will see the radiance that's come up and refracted in that direction. That's going to vary depending on the radiance distribution. And almost all of our measurements we make in optical oceanography are just the straight nadir radiance. And so you need to have some sort of an idea of how the, it's varying angularly. And so that's what this instrument was built for. Um, there shows it in the water, um, the fisheye lens looking down at being supported by floats and floating away from the ship to avoid ship shadow. Here's a magnitude of Upwelling rains in the blue water station where you see the peak is in the blue. Here's the green line is for a green station. You see the peaks all over the green. Um, since I didn't rewrite the axis, this goes from 400 to 800 nanometers. And from 0 to 180 um, microwatts per centimeter squared per nanometer per steradian. Why don't I have, oh, here it is. Ella, that's this is the ES, the L, um, LU is microwatts per centimeter squared per nanometer per stradian. It's going from zero to 1.8. Okay, here's a picture, I, you saw it before, of the downwelling radiance distribution. The little arrow represents where the sun angle is coming in, refracted sun angle. Um, this, these measurements, took a while to make so um, because we did a bunch of averaging a bunch of samples at one meter the sun was right on the horizon um, and so you see the radiance peaked in this area um, with because of Snell's law all the light it's called the manhole effect all the light coming in from the horizon say will be refracted into an angle 
within, say, uh, was it 50 degrees or so, 48 point something degrees in salt water. So if you're diving, you look up, you'll see the whole horizon refracted into a smaller area. So when you're near the surface, that, um, that circle where light comes in is sort of defined by the refract refraction at the surface. Um, as you go deeper, because the scattering, what you can see is like at 30 meters, that edge of the Snell's manhole doesn't matter anymore because the light's been scattered enough that you've lost that feature. Um, the light goes straight across, okay? So near the surface, all the light's coming in inside, inside a cone. As you get down, it, um, it, there's two things that happen. One is that the edge of the manhole sort of disappears. Secondly, uh, as we're coming down in the, in the water column, um, the peak in the radiance distribution tends to be in where the sun direction is. As you get down in the water column, say at 30 meters, the uh, sun direction was here, but the peak of the radiance distribution has moved over to being like straight down or closer to being straight down. Um, that's caused by scattering and absorption. Um, the light coming, if the sun's coming in in a direction like this, the light's going to be attenuated a little bit more strongly because of its uh, slant path versus the light coming from straight down. So as you go farther and farther in the water column, you expect the peak of the radiance distribution to move toward the center. Okay, And the asymptotic region that Colin talked about is where um, the radiance distribution no longer changes shape and it has to, theoretically, has to be centered with a uh, peak at the strongest radiance in the direct downward direction. Anyway, so you see these uh, downward radiance distributions. There are, we talked about VSF measurements not being made very much. Um, there's only, that I know about, three instruments that measure the radiance distribution. The ones I build, um, Satlantic built one for a project for the Navy. I don't think you could buy it I don't think they would sell you one. Um, and Seymour, uh, a French company, built one for David Antoine. And I tried to see if you could get a quote for that, and you can't get a quote for it. They're very hard to calibrate. They're very time-consuming to use. So um, we can skip that. The the one point here for the uh, upwelling radius distribution upwelling radiance distribution that I told you about. In clear water, it's fairly isotropic. In high chlorophyll water, it gets to be more shaped, um, which you'll remember that because in a second I'll be talking about uh, another factor that you need to worry about. To calibrate a radiance source, we have to have some sort of a, um, a extended source of radiance that will fill the field of view of your system. Um, the most common pe thing people use is a lamp ir producing irradiance, which falls on a, a reflectance plaque. So a spectralon plaque that reflects light fairly uh, uniformly. And then you point your instrument looking at that. And so that forms a source of radiance, just like looking at that wall with my eye. I'm basically measuring the radiance coming off of that with my eye. Um, with another way to do it is with an integrating sphere, and you look into a port in the integrating sphere. Integrating sphere is a, well, you had an integrating sphere. So you know, it's just white, scatters the light all over the place. Not many people do it this way. Almost everybody does it this way, mostly because it's cheaper, cheap to get a, relatively cheap to get a lamp that's calibrated. 